attention. Brother Drew, please read our scripture today and then say a prayer of invocation. Good morning, church. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 19. While he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, Fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You demand the Holy and Righteous One and ask to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life, whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in His name, His name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given Him this perfect health in front of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Therefore, repent and turn back, so that your sins may be wiped out. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your church. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his blood on the cross that saves us. Father, we just ask that you be with us now as we go through in our service. Be with our pastor. Speak to him and through him. Guide him with your words. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say together, Amen. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. Now, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we looked at Peter and John going into the temple for prayer time and there was a man, a lame man that was begging there at the gate called Beautiful, one of the busiest gates going in and this man would lay there and beg for money as people walked in to go into their prayer time. Now back then it was well known that if you were a, a, a good Jew that you would give to the less fortunate you would give to the needy and that's why these people would wait outside the gates and beg and when Peter and John came by he was begging from them and they said well we don't have any money but we'll give you something even better they said in the name of Jesus Christ get up and walk and the man was able to get up on his feet and walk and he was so happy and so joyful he began to dance around and praise God and it drew the attention of everybody going into the temple. Now, back then, Christianity was under fire. They wanted to squelch this movement, these Jesus followers, they wanted to get rid of. This was everybody from the government to the church leaders, to the temple leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They wanted this Christian movement stopped. Now, a couple of things come into play here I want you to think about. Peter, and he is famous for denying Christ three times on the night that Christ was on trial because he was standing outside. They had a barrel going with fire in it, and he was warming himself. And one of the, the young ladies said, Hey, that guy right there, he's one of them Jesus followers. And Paul denied, or uh, Peter denied, he said, No, I'm not. I don't know that man. Three times to the point where Peter was cursing about not knowing Christ. He was so afraid of his, for his own life that he denied Jesus Christ, the miracle worker that claimed to be the Son of God, that claimed to be the Messiah, that claimed to be the Savior of the world. Peter had witnessed what Christ had done and was yet so afraid for his life that when it came down to it, he denied Jesus Christ. There are many people today that will deny Jesus. They'll come to church on Sunday, but when it comes time to go out into the world the rest of the week, they deny having faith. They don't want to be looked down on. They don't want people making fun of them. They don't want to uh, have people looking 
at them like something's wrong with them, so they'll deny Christ when they're out in public, but they'll come into church and yell amen. If you're like that today, I hope this message will change your outlook on your faith. Because as she just sang, we believe. If you call yourself a Christian, you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins. You believe that He was resurrected three days later. Now here's some further evidence for the resurrection being true. Peter, who denied Christ for the fear of his own life, stood in the temple of the Jews and proclaimed Jesus Christ. Without fearing for his own safety or his own life, he told the people when they started looking at him and John like they did a miracle for this man to walk, Peter said, no, 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 no. It was not us. It was Jesus Christ. It was God who glorified Jesus Christ as the one that healed this man. Peter put himself in peril, and we'll see next week if the Lord tarries nothing and rapture us back home, we'll see next week what came of Peter's message when he dared to stand up and proclaim Jesus Christ. So what do we learn from this? A couple of things I want you to take away from this. I hope you got one of the fill-in-the-blank sheets so you can follow along. There's actual scripture in there that we'll be going to to support what I'm getting ready to say. And you can take this home for yourself and study it. And I hope you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock if you have any questions about what's being preached today. Because I want you to be clear on why we believe and why it's important that we share our faith and that we stand up and we testify. Number one, we see that we should always give glory to God. On your own, you're not doing anything that makes any eternal sense. You're not doing anything that has any eternal power in and of itself. If you work every day and you support your family, God bless you. I'm glad you do that. That's an awesome thing. But one day you're going to lose that job. One day you're going to retire. One day you're going to die. And all that work you did is going to amount to nothing. That's just a plain and simple fact. Understand that there are people that have headstones that are over 100 years old that nobody has any idea who they are. And that's going to be you one day if Jesus Christ tarries and rapturing the church and coming back to rule the earth. One day you're going to have a headstone or you're going to be in an urn and someone's going to come across it and say, who was Chris Woody? I don't know. They might even ask around. Anybody know who this guy was? Now some old preacher. All right, throw it away. It's not going to amount to anything. What we do here on this earth under our own power, understand we must do good works. But if it's not under the power of Christ, it doesn't mean much. So everything that we do, we give the glory to God. You've heard me say this before when you get up on Monday morning to go to work. Give glory to God that you can go to work. Don't sit there and go, ah, another week. Uh, one of the jokes that we have at work that Doug likes to say is uh, on Monday morning, well, it's day one of the hostage situation. we got got three more days left. But folks, we need to, to thank God that we have the ability to work and to earn a living. We give glory to God. I love it when I stand down there and people come down and shake my hand, give me a hug and say, great sermon, Pastor. Really enjoyed it. Good message. And I Praise God. Thank God. Thank God. It's not me. It's God. Because if I were to write my own message under my own opinion, with my own thought process, it would be gibberish to most of you. But because the Holy Spirit leads the message, and the message comes from the Word of God, it is meant to encourage you and to enhance your life as a Christian. So we always give glory to God. The psalmist knew this. David, in Psalm 29, 1 and 2, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. If you paid attention to the songs we sang this morning, what do we sing? Holy, 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 God Almighty. 
Holy, holy, holy. And have faith in God. Have faith in God. Do you have faith in God when you get in your car and you go out driving somewhere? You say, God, protect this vehicle, protect me from others and others from me. And then when someone cuts you off in traffic, do you forget God's riding along with you? And you give them the number one salute or call them some names that shouldn't be coming out of a Christian's mouth? Have faith in God. Have faith in God. So you all got up this morning and you came to church. Go you. That is awesome. I'm glad you did it. But there are some here today under duress. There are some that only came because mom and dad drug them to church. There are some that only came because they feel like that's the thing they have to do. Some only came because they thought that it would make God happy. Well, it does please God when you show faith in Him. But I don't want us to lose sight of the reason we come to church. Folks, we come to church to glorify God. Now, we, we come here with burdens. We have our, our weekly burdens are on us. Those of us who are, are married, we know that a godly marriage never has disagreements or problems or issues, and that's a joke for those of you who are taking me seriously right now. We all have issues in our relationships. And... As someone who stands in the hallway and watches people come in, you can tell the couples that aren't really getting along that well that morning. But that's okay. You came into the house of the Lord. Give glory to God. Give that relationship issue up to God, and He will take care of it. When you put God at the center of your marriage, your marriage will be joyful. It won't always be happy, but it will always be joyful. So, we come to church and we come to glorify God. You ever wonder why God made you? I'm getting ready to tell you. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory, I have formed them. Indeed, I have made them. Folks, we are created for God, for His glory. Scripture says that everything that was created was created by Jesus Christ, was created for Jesus Christ. Everything and everybody was created for God's good pleasure to glorify God and to edify Jesus Christ in the church. That's why you're here today. Glorify God in everything that you do. I love what Paul says to the letter in uh, uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 6 and verse 14. Paul says, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. What does he mean by that? He means that all the worldly, fleshly systems of sin and temptation and greed died the day he accepted Christ as his Savior. It died on the cross of Calvary when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. My worldly desires, when I come to Christ, must die on the cross of Calvary. I must deny myself, die to myself, and live for Christ alone. Folks, that's what a Christian does. We forego the world and all the temptation. Now let me tell you something. You know, a lot of people come down on the Baptists because we seem to be against the LBTGQ and we seem to be against uh, abortion. and, And we are because those things upset God. But the truth of the matter is, when we come to Christ, we're still sinful. When we come to Christ, we're still selfish. When we come to Christ, we still lie. What we have to do as Christians is... Pray, and God says that He will make a way out of the temptation. He does not take the temptation away. If you're born a liar, you'll die a liar, but if you're a Christian, you'll refrain from lying because you're following Christ and you choose not to lie. If you feel like you were born gay, that's okay. When you're reborn, He's not going to take all of that temptation away, but what He will do is give you a way to escape that temptation so you will choose not to engage in that activity. 
Now, some of y'all are getting ready to lie to me. Who in here has had an impure thought this week? All right, the rest of you that wish to lie to me, that's okay. We all have impure thoughts. We all do. What we don't do is act on those thoughts. We have urges to sin. What we don't do is act on those urges. When we have those thoughts, we need to reach out to God and put Jesus in your mind because there's no room for Jesus and impure thoughts in your mind at the same time. That's why the Bible instructs us to stay continually in prayer so there's no room for all that evilness that wants to get in there. So Peter starts out his talk by giving glory to God who glorified Jesus. And like I told you, apart from Jesus, any good that we do is temporary. With Jesus, any good we do will result in eternal eternal fruit, for lack of a better word. Now, we found out a few weeks ago when Jesus said that you will bear fruit, He's talking about our lives being part of the, the branches and Jesus being the, the vine. And we produce fruit and fruit produces seeds which produces more fruit. So if you're a fruitful Christian, you're producing more Christians. You're witnessing to people. You're standing up. You're testifying. You're helping others come to Christ. That's the fruit that Jesus talks about when He talks about producing fruit. You don't believe me, read Matthew chapter 28 and see what Jesus instructs believers to do. Go out into the world and make disciples. Not beg disciples. Not beat people over the head with the Bible until they become a disciple. But you live a godly life and you witness for Christ and you make disciples. Because in John 15, 5, just what we were talking about, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Are you in Christ today? If Christ is in you, you have to be in Christ. There's, you, there's no two ways about it. If you are in Christ, He is in you, you will produce fruit. But you must remain in Him. What does that signify to us? If it says we must remain, that means we're able to not remain in Christ. That means we're able to walk away from Him. That means that we, in fact, are able to deny Christ. And many people do. A Christian should never deny Christ even when things get tough. And that's what Peter was doing here. If Peter wanted to save his own skin, he would have said, oh, that was God that healed the man and He uh, just gave me the power to do it temporarily. No, he, he gave the glory to God who glorified Jesus Christ. He made no bones about it. So we must glorify Jesus in everything that we do. And why should we do that? Well, number two is our sin is why Jesus was sacrificed. Paul sinned, Bill sinned, Jane sinned, my sin, all y'all, everybody. Everybody. If, if you're puffed up and you think you've never broken one of the Ten Commandments, I guarantee you you've lied. I guarantee you you've put another God before God. And I'll tell you right now, the sin you committed killed Jesus Christ. Everybody wants to blame the Jews. Everybody wants to blame the Romans. It was your sin that caused Jesus Christ to go to the cross of Calvary. So Jesus was sacrificed because of your sin. So you need to understand that when it comes time to glorify God. When someone looks at you and says, good job, give the glory to God. I don't care what it is. If you're a good mechanic and you fix something, Give the glory to God. If you're an accountant and you do someone's taxes and they thank you, give the glory to God. Whatever you do, give the glory to God. And if you're getting ready to do something that doesn't glorify God, don't do it. If you can't glorify God in anything, it's best to stay away from that thing. David, once again in the Psalms, recognizes what he has done. And he says in Psalm 51, 4, Against you, God, you alone, 
I have sinned and done this evil thing in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. God has every right to take someone's life because He gave them life. God has every right to judge you on your life, your thoughts, and your actions. But praise be to God, Jesus Christ died, so we don't have to face that. God is fair and just. Most people, when you walk up to them and you're talking about spiritual things, and you look at them and you say, describe God in one word. What's most people going to say? Love. Love. That's mostly what they say. Those who love their sin will say, God loves me, He wants me to be happy. Nowhere in Scripture does it say God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyful. But nowhere does it say God will excuse your sin because He wants you to be happy. That's just not in there. God is fair and just. Yes, He is love. He is the perfect standard of love and love is perfect justice love judges perfectly and God reserves the right to judge all of humankind because he created all of humankind and I'll remind you that nowhere in the scripture does it say that a Christian cannot judge another Christian Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. What about when Jesus said, judge not unless you be judged by the same measure? We are going to be judged by the same measure, and we should be judged by the same measure. As a pastor, you all sit out here every Sunday and judge my sermon. Whether you want to believe that or not, you do. You make judgments all the time, and I thank God that you make judgments all the time. We should be judging stuff, whether it's good or bad, constantly. Scripture says that we are to be on the lookout for false teachers. How are you going to pick out a false teacher if you don't judge them? You can't. You have to judge the message that is coming from anybody. I don't care what it is. You are to judge that message. When someone that you know claims to be a Christian and they're living in apparent sin, it is not only your right, but it is a command that you are to take that person aside and counsel them on their sin, and they're going to get mad at you and say, you can't judge me. And you can look back at them and say, yes, I can. The Bible tells me I can. I have removed the plank from my eye so I can see the speck in your eye, and I see that you're living a life that doesn't honor God, and yet you call yourself a Christian. My God and my Savior deserves an honest witness, not someone that's going around twisting up the Scriptures or living like the devil claiming to be a Christian. If you're a Christian, live like a Christian. So David tells God, I know I'm a sinner. I know against you and you alone I have sinned, that you have seen my sin. God sees your sin whether anybody else does or not. You need to confess to God anything in your life that doesn't honor Him. In John 3.16, everybody should know this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. You see, God knows you're a sinner. God made you. God can read your mind. Satan cannot, but that's a different sermon for a different day. But God absolutely knows your thoughts. We see that proven out through the Scriptures and the words of Jesus. Every time Jesus encountered the scoffers and the doubters, the first thing He said is, why are you thinking this? Because He knew what they were thinking. So God knows everything that you think. And even though you rejected God early in your life, God still loved you enough to die on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, we should give honor to God in everything that we do. God Himself, God in flesh, Hosanna in the highest, God the only begotten Son, took Himself to the cross of Calvary to die so that you could be found righteous. 
That's why He died. That's why we give Him honor and why we give Him glory. God put your sin on Jesus so that He could pay your penalty on the cross of Calvary. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We might takes faith. See, salvation is still available today. Some 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ is still saving sinners. But the sinner has to acknowledge his sin before God, just as David did, and recognize the need for a Savior, and understand who Jesus is, and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that He died on the cross of Calvary, and was resurrected three days later. That's how you find salvation. Number three, Jesus died for all people, not just a select few. And y'all have heard me say this before, and I'll debate a Calvinist until my dying breath. God wants all to come to salvation. He didn't just handpick a few. He wants everyone to be saved. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You all understand that very same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus out of the grave is the very same Holy Spirit that will live in you when you put your faith in Jesus? Do you understand that the same resurrection that Jesus got is the same resurrection that you will have when you know Christ is your Savior, and that if you have already accepted Christ as your Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that you will not die? You will not die. Your outer body will deteriorate and pass away, but your spirit will not die. You will immediately leave the dead body and be with the Lord. Scripture bears that out. That is what happens to us when we leave. But we must know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. If you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, because you believe that God wants you to be happy in your sin, I want to let you know you are not on a quest for truth. You're on a quest for your own happiness. Now many people fall into this. But what I urge people to do when I witness to them, when I talk to them, yes, I want to lead them to Christ. Yes, I want them to say a sinner's prayer. Yes, I want them to accept Christ at that point. But 99% of the time what happens is I have to convince them to do some homework, to do some study. See, we don't have a blind faith. Our faith is supported by evidence. We have the evidence of Jesus Christ. We have evidence of God. And there's nothing wrong with producing that evidence because even the Bible gives us evidence. It says in Romans chapter 1 that we can look out at creation and know that there is a Creator. And then there's something else that follows that. It says because God has proven to us His existence through His creation that man is without excuse. You have no excuse for rejecting God because the evidence is there. But you have to decide for yourself. You have to do the hard work because if I talk you into being saved, the world's going to talk you right back out of it. All I can talk you into is seeing the evidence, believing the evidence, and understanding that all of this is real. All of this is real. Number four, salvation is still available to all who will repent. That's something that's not preached a lot today. Repentance is left out of a lot of messages. Why? Because 
most preachers want everyone to believe that God is love and loves them just the way they are and they can come the way they are. If they get baptized, they'll be saved and Jesus is perfectly fine with leaving them the way He found them. But that is not what Scripture teaches. That is not the truth at all. When someone comes to Christ, they get the Holy Spirit, they should want to repent from sin. Repent doesn't mean you automatically stop sinning. It means that you have a heart that is grieved by sin, and when you do sin, it bothers you so much that you can't help but cry out to God for forgiveness. Because Jesus did die for your sins, but you have to have a repentant heart for that sin. You see, we've taught the ABCs of salvation in Vacation Bible School for so long that everybody should know that. You know, ABC, accept, believe, confess. All that's true. But the only three things that it takes for salvation is belief in Christ, faith in Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to God that they are sins. Don't put them off on your parents. Don't put them off on how you were brought up. Don't put them off on the culture around you. If you sin, you sin because you chose to sin. You confess that to God and then you repent. That brings salvation. Now, many false messages are out there, and they're out there today. I believe that the rapture of the church isn't that far away. I believe the seven years of tribulation aren't that far away. We see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9-12, through 12, it says, The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working, with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders, serving the lie. That's why Paul says, if anybody teaches you a gospel that's contrary to what you have been taught through God's Word, ignore it, do away with it, don't listen to it, run away. You believe what God has given us in His written Word. Verse 10 says, And with every wicked deception among those who are perishing, They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. People hate the truth. LBTGQ hates the truth. Abortionists hate the truth. People who swindle, cheat, and lie hate the truth. They dream up their own truth. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. God already knows who's going to accept and who's not. And if you deny God enough, He'll give you over to your delusion. Verse 12 says, So that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. Pride is a sin. Pride is a sin. Those who delight in sinning against God will face the wrath of God. And it is loving and just everything that He does, but they won't think so at the time. See, many deny the truth because they do not want God to be the sovereign Lord of their life. People reject God because they don't want to believe that someone else is in control of their destiny. But folks, you have no control over your destiny. Friday, I met with a woman up at the uh, hospital. Many of you know her. Her name is Patty Zimmerly. She attended here for a very long time. She's been going through dialysis, which has been causing other health problems. When I leave here today, I'm going back to the hospital to meet with her family and with the doctors because she has to make a decision. She has to decide if she's going to stop her dialysis, which causes her other issues, and allow hospice to come in, or she has to decide to keep going through this dialysis, which causes her so much pain and problems. And folks, the decision that she makes could be life or death. But she has to make that decision. Now, she knows Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. We've already established that. I've already talked to her. We've already prayed about it. She knows that when she leaves this earth, that she's going to be with the Lord. You 
may not have the luxury of planning your death. You have no idea when God's going to call you away from this earth. Have you given in to the delusion? Do you believe the world? And do you believe Satan? People believe that God is love and there's no way that a loving God would send someone to hell. And the truth is your sin is what sends you to hell. God gives you a get out of hell free card. You have to use it. You see, many people believe that they can retain control of their destiny because of their desires and their beliefs. Your truth may not be the truth. Everybody likes to talk about their individual truth. There is a standard of truth given to us right here. And then there's the truth that you make up in your own mind. See, most guys I know will look at the mirror and go, I'm one handsome dude. Truth is, most of us aren't near as handsome as we think we are, fellas. Truth will lie to you. Your truth will lie to you. The truth of God's Word stays constant through everything. You can trust what God's Word tells us. Go on to 2 Corinthians 5.15. And He, Jesus, died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Do you live for Jesus? Or are you living for yourself and playing church? You have to deal with that. You have to come to that conclusion. Because the Bible is the only objective truth that we have. Your individual beliefs will bring subjective ideas that will change due to your circumstances. We see that in young people today who were given gender-affirming care early in life, and now they're in their 20s regretting their decision. The rate of suicide is starting to pick up for people who have had these surgeries, who have become what they thought they needed to be, only to find out that God made them perfect the way they were. They just didn't understand it at the time. If you want to, I'm going to tell you, parents, be gender-affirming to your children. Y'all hear me? This is a preacher. Be gender-affirming to your children. And you do that by going to God's Word and you affirm to them, you were born a boy, you are a boy, you will be a boy till the day you die. You were born a girl, God made you a girl, you're perfect the way you are, and you will be a girl until you die. Put your faith in God, find your identity in Jesus Christ, and you will not be as confused about who you think you should be. But have faith. God made you the way you're supposed to be. God does not make mistakes. Now, last point. Coming to terms with your sinful self will produce grief. I want to make sure I didn't miss any of the fill in the blanks. Coming to terms with your sinful self. I don't care who you are. If you're within the sound of my voice, if you're on... Facebook, YouTube, if you're listening to the audio from the website, you are sinful. I don't care who you are. Every single one of us deals with sin. Coming to terms with your sin will produce grief. You have worldly grief that blames God or your parents or your surroundings or your upbringing or your family or anything else. to to deflect the blame from who is really to blame, that will bring grief that leads to separation from God. Or you can have godly grief over your sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but worldly grief produces death. You see, you will grieve over your sin one day. You'll either come to terms with it while you're still alive and breathing. You can give those sins over to Christ, live forever. Or you can keep your sin, live your worldly life, but one day you're going to stand in front of the judgment seat 
and then you're really going to have grief over your sin because then it'll be too late. Because a day is coming when we will no longer be under grace and mercy that Jesus Christ provides for the church. See, right now, we live in an age of grace. We live in an age of mercy. We live in an age where we can say, Jesus Christ died for my sins. We live in an age where we can come to Christ, where we can say, Jesus Christ, I know that you're my Savior. I know you died on the cross of Calvary. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I put my faith in you and I give you my life. Or we can be like the demons and acknowledge who Jesus is and go on and continue our sinful lifestyle. But that will lead to the worldly grief that will lead to the gnashing of teeth, the shedding of tears, because it's coming, folks. One day you're going to meet your destiny. One day you're going to leave this earth, whether it's through the rapture, whether it's through being killed during the seven years of tribulation, or natural death. But you're going to leave this earth. And then you will stand in front of the perfect judge, God, and give an account for what you did with your life. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, On that day, many will look at the judge. The judge will be Jesus Christ. And they'll say, Jesus, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we go to church? Didn't we go to Sunday school? Didn't we pastor a church? Didn't we do all this wonderful stuff in your name, Jesus? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, Depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. What does that mean? That means those who continue to live in sin, even after acknowledging Jesus Christ, are not saved. You cannot live in sin, you cannot be okay with sin, and claim to be a Christian and claim salvation. You must have that repentant heart over sin. You must be bothered by sin to the point where you want it out of your life, to the point where you will avoid circumstances where you're tempted to sin. You will take that stuff out of your life. But you have to give your life to Christ first. It's not just as simple as saying a prayer and getting dunked in the water and calling yourself good. A life devoted to Christ will produce fruit. Now, I can't preach anybody into heaven. All I can do is present to you what the, the God's Word says, and then you have to make that decision. So today, I hope you make a wise decision. I hope you decide to do away with your worldly life, like Paul said, when Jesus died on that cross, and I came to Christ, all of my worldly desires died with Him. And I die to myself daily and give myself over to Christ. But you have to decide to do that. No one can do it for you. So as we go into this invitation time, the invitation is open to any and all. Come and know Christ today. If you came in today and you've got worldly burdens weighing you down, come up to this altar, give it to Christ, and don't pick it back up. Have faith in God. He will take all your troubles and your worries. Now, you will still have problems in this world. You're, we're all going to have problems and issues until the day that we leave this earth. But praise be to God. He didn't say He would do away with our problems, but He'll be with us through our problems. And I can promise you, if you live a godly lifestyle, if you live your life according to the Word of God, you will have fewer and fewer problems. That's just a plain and simple fact. But you have to make that decision. So this altar will be open. I will be available to anybody who wants to talk or have prayer. Um, if you've been attending here for a while and you think you might like to join us here at Tall Pines Baptist Church, membership is important. But we would love for you to come and be a part of what God is doing here at Tall Pines Baptist Church. So we're going to pray. We'll have a song of invitation during that time. Don't deny the Holy Spirit. Don't fight Him yet another day. Come to the Lord. Give yourself over to Jesus Christ and live in that peace and harmony that He promises us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful.
for your word. We're thankful for the witness of uh, the Apostle Peter and John and Father the Apostle Paul. What a great testimony to a life-changing altercation as they came to know the risen Christ. Father,